our office. First, with the female icon, are right here on the right. With the male icon, you need to go a bit more further and also on the left side. So, that's it. I guess that without further ado, I can invite Lukáš Havlíček on the stage. He's not only a senior software engineer in Pipedrive, but he is also an MMA fighter. And he will talk about building more robust AI apps with Langchain. Oh, are we good? Is the mic on? Test, 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 test. Okay, uh, test. I'll try to be loud. So, uh, hello. I'm glad to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Lukáš. I work as a senior software engineer here in Pipedrive. And today I would like to talk about like Length chain. So, uh, what what's length chain? Let's start with the obvious question, right? Uh, length chain is. I guess I will try. Yeah, yeah. I'll try with this one, and you can. I'll manage. Okay. okay. Test, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so what's Langchain? Langchain is a framework for building, uh, ba for basically for building AI applications in general. Uh, more specifically, it's for building applications uh, built around uh, language models. Uh, I don't want to go into too much theory, but uh, I guess I can say that uh, these applications built around language models usually revolve uh, around uh, passing a input, usually called prompt, to the model, and getting back some some response from the model. Uh, I would say some common use cases uh, uh, with using client chain can include obviously some chatbots, uh, creating some summaries, and stuff like that. Uh, one of the benefits, uh, I would say, for me personally, one of the most one of the most important benefits is that uh, this framework uh, offers a uh, nice abstraction. What it means, I will show in a couple of minutes. But basically, uh, it means that you are not tied to a specific provider, being it OpenAI, right, with ChatGPT, being it Bard from Google. You can basically build the application, and then later on, you can swap the model. Uh, as you wish. So uh, let's start with a <clears throat> sorry. Let's start with a short demo. Uh, disclaimer: I have built this um, kind of playground for for this framework. Uh, it's a CLI tool. It doesn't mean that the framework itself is CLI tool. It's mainly as a mainly to showcase the features. And I want to show this uh, tool now because later I will be showing uh, prompts and uh, results we will be getting from the models. So you you will know what are we looking at. So it's an NPM script. As I mentioned, it's a uh, CLI tool. And uh, it showcases some of the features that this framework uh, offers. You can see, um, you can actually play with it yourself later, but uh, you can call the model directly. Uh, you can call the model uh, with basically the model is instructed to behave as a uh, West American Western cowboy. Uh, you can query search engine and and more stuff. And when you select feature, you can also select a model that you want to use. Uh, this framework offers uh, several of um, Basically, integrations with third party providers of these models. I have selected just a few of them. OpenAI, obviously, is probably the most popular one. 
uh, GPT-2 mainly because I wanted to uh, try out Hugging Face, which is supposed to be a um, kind of library for models. But to be honest, uh, at least for me, GPT-2 was returning just like quite unusable data. And this Cohere, which I wasn't familiar with before, but it also returns quite nice results comparable to OpenAI, I would say. So then you can add prompt. Uh, I will quickly add some, some short example. Let's start a little bit controversial. And OpenAI actually says it's a controversial topic. And yeah, if I would ask uh, Cohere, I don't want to go there now, but you can try yourself later. It's comparable. Usually Cohere returned, for me at least, uh, longer and like more verbose and rich, rich responses. So back to the slides. Yeah, abstraction. As I've already mentioned, um, this tool, this lang chain, is originally built in Python, but there is a uh, TypeScript or JavaScript variant of it. Uh, Feature-wise, it should be one-to-one. Um, -one. And if you are using TypeScript, uh, one of the nice things is that you basically can define a function which accepts this base large language model um, interface and uh, then you just call methods right for example here i just call call method i pass the prompt and that's it and i don't really care about if i am using um, gpt if i'm using this code here or whatever it doesn't really matter even providers can have different apis the model can have different api and this framework as I mentioned, offers this type of abstraction that I can just swap the model as I wish, and the, the code stays the same. Uh, another obvious feature I've already also mentioned is uh, uh, integration, basically, with model providers. Uh, going back to this example, here you can see this, uh, I'm passing some language model. How do I actually create it? Well, we have built in integrations in LangChain, and the only thing I need to do is basically create an instance. Here, for example, it's um, like chat model of OpenAI. Uh, I can select what temperature I want, what model I want. And this verbose parameter is quite useful, especially for advanced stuff, because uh, it will output of basically prompts that are being passed from lang chain to the model. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we have different providers. Here is an example of OpenAI. Uh, if I ask if basically the question is chocolate or vanilla ice cream, OpenAI thinks chocolate. If I ask the same thing over here, it thinks that vanilla ice cream is actually better. So uh, different models, different responses, and uh, in the end, it's up to us which model we want to use. And here is an example of GPT-2 in Hugging Face. As I mentioned, it starts telling me that pineapple is actually a mushroom. OK. <laughs> Uh, some other providers that I haven't used in, in the um, playground, or how should I call it, uh, but the integrations are in the framework is Antrafic. The reason is because there's in currently early access. I have asked for it, but didn't really get in so far. And Replicate, which works with images. Uh, yeah, uh, these were these were models, but external integrations are not just for models. We can also use search engine, for example, because one of the limitations of the models is that uh, they are trained on a set of data, and the data can be outdated, right? So, 
if it's trained on data up until, I don't know, uh, 2022, and I want to ask what's the weather today, it probably won't be able to tell me the result. It might try to guess it based on um, maybe same day, but the year before, but it just can't know what's, what the weather is today. But there is a built-in integration with the search engine API. And <clears throat> only thing I need to do is, again, create an instance of this uh, tool, pass it to the model. And if you use the verbose parameter, you will actually see that uh, the model is instructed that it has this tool available. And if it needs to search for something, it just can like, um, basically, uh, the, the lang chain serves in this sense as a sort of bridge between these tools and the models, uh, but it's still just using prompts to instruct the models. And this screenshot was taken yesterday, and this was actually quite accurate. I mean, I'm not sure if 0.78 is was the uh, was the like degrees what it was yesterday, but yeah, I would say that around 70 degrees. That's how it was. So these were these were uh, tools or integrations with external providers, but we also have some internal tools. Uh, one of them is how we actually communicate with the model. Uh, we have something called prompts. We can actually differentiate between three types. We can use system prompt, human prompt, or AI prompt. Human and AI is at least as far as I know, mostly used for um, basically telling the model, uh, showing some examples of communication and how I would like the answer or the response to look like. I will show it later. Uh, system prompt is uh, meant for instructing the model how it should behave, giving it some boundaries, limitations. As far as I know, currently the models um, don't give it as high priority as they should, but uh, usually the providers say that they are working on it. And on top of that, uh, we can also use templating. So here you can see that we have this placeholder called input, and then we can, basi we can basically predefine these templates, and when we want to use them, we can just, based on the key, pass in some prompt or some string that we want to use. Yes, and in this example, again, this is the prompt I'm using for the cowboy model. Uh, I'm telling it it's a 19th century hostel owner in American Wild West. Uh, message from the customer is got a spare room, and this is the response that I will get from the model. I would say it looks quite authentic. Another tool we can use is browser. Uh, in a sense, maybe similar to search engine, NPI, search engine API, but not really, because browser works in a way that I instruct it to visit some URL, and I can pass a prompt, ask about stuff, but uh, those things need to be on that URL. So if I, for example, use URL pipedrive.com and ask what's pipedrive, you can see that it uh, it can parse this data from the website and it can tell me that PyDrive is a web-based sales CRM. But if I would visit the same site and I would ask uh, what's the pricing of PyDrive, the information is not on the homepage. So it can't really tell me. But what it will do is at least in relevant links on the first spot there will be a pricing page link. Another feature is memory. Uh, again, one of the limitations of models is that they don't have a memory. Basically, they uh, unless you repeat what they have told you or what you said before, they won't remember it. So if you will um, say what's your name and then ask what's my name, they won't know. But uh, there's this integration and different types, actually. You can use like in-memory, uh, you can 
There's even an integration with Redis, databases, different, maybe even AWS. But for this example, I've used just basic uh, in-memory integration. And when I told OpenAI that I'm Luke Skywalker, it says, oh, hey, I am AI assistant. And it remembered that I'm Luke Skywalker. And actually, fun fact, when I use this with Cohere, it starts playing uh, Star Wars with me and says it's R2D2. Uh, yeah, uh, this feature is in uh, for the framework. It's quite important. I would say that's actually why it's called LangChain. At least that's what the docs say. Uh, this is a sort of abstraction that allows you to combine different tools with models. So this previous example that you saw is actually just these three lines of code. Basically, if I don't think about formatting, you just create a uh, instance of memory. You use this built-in conversation chain, you pass a model, and you just call it, and that's it. You don't really need to care about repeating the, the history or anything. Uh, yeah, uh, this I will just mention what's underlined there. Uh, when I was showing prompts, I said that we have three types, and that is system, human, and an AI, and AI. And what it can be used for is that you can actually feed the model some like in example input and example output. How would you like it to reply? And uh, one of the nice examples of usage, I would say, is for example, if you want to generate an email response, but you want the response to sound, li sound like you, well, with generic model, it's kind of hard, right? Because it's trained on like generic data, and usually it wouldn't really sound like you. But if you feed it enough data and you label it saying, I'm human, I'm saying this, you are AI, you are saying that. In this example, I always try to use howdy in the beginning and adios in the end. And you can see that when I call the model later, it actually also uses howdy and adios. Yeah, and last tool <clears throat> that basically builds on top of everything is agent. Uh, it's basically chain with the exception that the language model is uh, deciding what uh, what actions it's going to take. There are two types. One is action agent, which basically works in a way that it decides what needs to be done. It takes the action, then it again decides what's need, what needs to be done, takes the action, and on repeat. The second one is called plan and execute, and the difference is that it basically creates a battle plan up front. It decides on all the actions that need to be taken, and then it uh, executes w those actions one at a time. And uh, yeah, in this example, I've used model, search, search engine integration, and uh, memory also, yes. And I've asked who is the current president of the Czech Republic. The response was correct, Petr Pavel, and then what's the name of his or her spouse without without even specifying who I am who am I talking about? And thanks to using memory, it usually knows who I'm talking about, and in this case shows the correct answer that it's Eva Pavlova. Uh, this agent is compared to the uh, the the second one I've mentioned, this is much faster, I would say like ten times faster at least. But I would say that it's usually um, less precise and um, less deterministic in the in the results that I was getting. Here you can see an example of a sort of fail attempt. When I ask uh, what's the name of his or her spouse, uh, it says that it does not have accurate information. And with the other type of agent, uh, it actually even mentions according to the sources provided because if you turn on the verbose mode, you will see that 
Usually it finds the result quite quickly, but it always tries to search for different sources. It, it even, comp not compares, well, yes, compares to, but it even checks if the source is trustworthy. And because of that, it can take, I mean, even, even a minute to get the result from this. Again, this was a correct result. This was also a correct result. I've uh, noticed later that I didn't mention his last spouse. And it says that his second wife is Eva Pavlova, but uh, we need to check if there are any information available on his previous spouse. And it even tells you what you need to search for if you want additional results. But even this agent uh, can return horrible, horrible results. It actually told me that Milo Zeman is still a president and will be for five more years. <laughs> yeah, and uh, now I would just like to show you a quick example of how we can build our own chatbot using this framework. So I have prepared a small script. Uh, this is basically mostly a boilerplate. It's using this uh, node uh, module called readline that will just read input from, uh, from command line and do something with it. And I'm also using just some, uh, just, just some prompts. But this is mainly a boilerplate. The important thing will be happening here. On every line I input, it will call a chatbot that we will with input string, and we will need to instantiate that chatbot. And uh, because I don't remember names of those methods, I can just go to documentation, and they actually have a section called conversational agent. And you can see here that basically only thing I need is create a model. In this case, it's using uh, OpenAI, so we can just use this second thing I need uh, in this case at least or it would work even without it but what it's useful <laughs> what is useful is uh, these tools uh, one of the tools you see here is calculator because apparently uh, the model has problems with calculating stuff. But again, uh, you can instruct it that if it receives a mathematical operation, it will just pass it to this calculator. But what I need here is just this SERP API. So I will create tools. It is search engine API. And we are almost there actually. What I need now is just uh, this built in agent uh, with type chat conversational react description. I don't even need verbose mode because it's very verbose. And yeah, that's basically it. Now, only thing I need is result. I will call the executor and I will pass the input I'm getting. And uh, uh, it's not typed, unfortunately, the result. Sorry, result. Yeah, thank you, good point. <laughs> And I think it's output. Yes, output. Yes, and if we run it now, our chatbot. Again, what's the weather today? It will take some time to answer. It's 
taking more time than usual. Uh, uh, it's dependent on your location. Okay, so I will need to pass it. I'm in in Prague. But anyway, we don't need to go into more examples here, I guess. But the thing is that basically, really, with just creating a model using search engine API, using built-in agent, and calling this agent, we have a chatbot, basically. Uh, one important note here is that uh, I have not been using it here because it can be extracted from environment variables, but for most of these things, you will need API keys. And yes, that's about it. Thank you. And forgot to mention, if you scan this QR code, it will lead you to that GitHub repo where you can play with the playground. Hello, hello. Thank you very much, Lukash, for amazing talk. Let's fire up the Slido. Before we start, one controversial question, which I saw you used as an example. I believe it's almost dividing the nations. So pineapple on the pizza, yes or no? For me, it is yes. Oh, God. OK. <laughs> Okay, first question. When will Pipedrive launch JetGPT plugin? Well, I sure hope soon. <laughs> I guess, I mean, I would like to give more, a better answer, but I don't know. Let's hope soon. Lukash, do you want a beer? I will get one later. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can you talk about the most complicated real-life use cases that you solved with LangChain so far? Uh, real-life use cases? Well, I don't think I have one so far. To be honest, I was mainly playing with the tool. But, um, yeah, I mean, having the option to query anything, basically, because one of the things I haven't mentioned is that... Uh, uh, you don't need to use web browser or, or search engine. It has uh, built-in data loaders for all sorts of different stores. You can load JSON, you can connect it to database. So basically, you can feed it all the data you have and then just query the model on top of your data. So uh, in this sense, I would say that it's kind of limitless. Thank you. How does the model know how to use different tools, e.g. search engine? Yeah, so again, if you turn on the verbose mode, then uh, it's actually, I would say, even nice thing how to learn prompt engineering in a sense, because you see uh, the prompt that LangChain is passing to the model, and it's usually instructing the model that, hey, here is this tool that you can use. If you want to use it, just tell me what you want to do with it in a sense, if I would put it simply. So it's kind of like a bridge, but... Uh, uh, it always uh, boils down to the fact that LangChain is passing prompts to the model, and these uh, tools are just um, getting input from the model and doing something with it, and then returning the result. Cool. What is the pricing? How much money would I burn if I create some public service using AI? Yeah, good question. Um, with models, the pricing uh, is quite fair, I would say. With the search engine, not so much. Uh, it offers like 100 free searches, which I burned in like a day or two. And the, the least expensive uh, plan starts at like, uh, what was it? Uh, 50 euros, I think. So for building something for fun, not that cheap, I would say. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, and actually Hugging Face, um, I'm not that familiar with it, but it's supposed to be this uh, library of usually free models to use. So if you train the model well, I guess you can use it for free. Nice. 
What's your experience with task decomposition, if any? Uh, not much. <laughs> would you like to try it anytime soon? Uh, I would. <laughs> Do you will use something like Copilot for pipe drive? Well, again, good question. I would say maybe more product related question. <laughs> We don't have anyone from product here at the moment, so we cannot ask. <laughs> Let's uh, jump to another question. Chat GPT plugin sounds amazing, but how about your customer's data security? Are they okay with that? How are you planning to communicate it? Yeah, uh, so this would always be a opt-in feature. We wouldn't do anything with customer data without their consent. And also, actually, um, one of the reasons why we haven't uh, jumped the hype train yet is that our uh, law um, department, I would say, uh, was uh, investigating it together with InfoSec. And I think that recently we actually got, uh, got approved. So, yeah, I think in this sense we should be safe. But, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, always an opt-in feature. And uh, the last question, um, Lukash is MMA. Anime fighter. fighter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much again. There is a little something for you. Guys, we're going to have 15 minutes break and then we will invite Honza. One, five, 15 minutes.
Halo, halo. Oke, okay. 15 minutes gone. Please finish whatever you doing and slowly come join us back so you can enjoy the second amazing talk from Honza. I will again encourage you to fire up Slido. The QR code is here or on the small paper spread around the office. Go ahead and ask Honza any kind of questions. These talks will be also shared with you after the event we are recording. So Lukas, Honza and Peter, all of them. Okay, beautiful human beings in the back, come and join us or stop talking. <laughs> yes. Okay, so the next talk will be from Honza Sladek. Honza is CEO and founder of Contember. Contember is open source platform for front-end developers to build and run custom backends. Honza will be talking about uh, building custom web apps um, and how easy it is with AI, or is it? And a fun fact, Honza has three kids in total, and the last one was born last week, seven days today, right? No, okay. You can have mine. Okay, it is. is it working now? Okay, great. So hopefully it won't have feedback this time. It's a it's a different one. I uh, I heard. So let's get right into it. Um, um thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, what I want to do today is show you live demo of building web app with AI, with our tool. Uh, I hope it's going to be uh, very interactive, so jump uh, uh, me into me talking, uh, uh, let's interact and discuss stuff. I'm going to be walking through uh, our Contember Studio, which is a basically web app uh, which helps you build different web apps. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to be... Uh, telling you how actually it works in the background. So uh, if you want to build something similar, you maybe have some, um, let's say, uh, manual how to do that. And if we have time, I'm going to uh, uh, give you a few tips and tricks uh, my team sent me today uh, to to give you. So so that's, that's my plan. Uh, OK, everyone cool with that? Great, so let's jump right into it. I'm gonna switch here to a different tab. So this is a studio. Uh, if anyone would want to try that later, I've got invites here, so stop by, talk to me. I'm gonna give you invite. Uh, and what we're gonna do is create a new project. And we could use some example like uh, CMS or document tracker. Uh, Studio currently is best for generating internal applications. Uh, 
So, but we're not gonna use some of the examples because it would be boring, right? Uh, it would fill everything for us. So, can anyone suggest some internal application to build here? We're in a, you know, they're doing a CRM, so something, not CRM preferably. Birthday gifts, okay. Okay, so we want to manage birthday gifts for family, okay? Cool, so uh, let's do that. Uh, I want to build an application to manage birth, uh, birthday uh, presents uh, for my family. Uh, let each member, family member, family, family member, um, at his her gifts and uh, let other members um, uh, assign themselves uh, to those uh, yep so cool so the first step uh, step is I'm gonna just tell it very simply what I want to build uh, and uh, what it's doing actually it's taking what we wrote uh, and through lang chain that you heard about uh, in a previous presentation it's sending it to gpt4 api we're currently using the openai gpt4 because it's probably the best model out there uh, at the moment it's also the most pricey uh, but still everything you're see you, you're gonna be seeing here uh, in the end, uh, the cost will be something under $1, uh, so it's not that much. Uh, at the beginning, it tells me what it can do. Actually, the Contember Studio generates application uh, uh, in our open source Contember platform. It's designed uh, to build uh, basically backends, so it gives you instant GraphQL API, it gives you authentication and users. Uh, and gives you uh, roles, management, etc., etc. So um, we basically summarize uh, what it can uh, give you. In the background, if you would uh, look at the prompt, uh, uh, we basically tell GPT-4, here's, here's the input from the user, uh, and Contember can do these things and can't do these things. Please reply to the user, uh, and summarize what we can do or cannot do for him or her. So that, that's what's happening here. We al also uh, try to uh, figure out the application type because uh, based on the application type we switch layouts and, and stuff. So that, that's not super interesting uh, at the moment. Uh, we've got this. Uh, we can continue to roles. The sec second thing, obviously, we need here is some uh, users that will use our app. So uh, um, it's not written here, uh, it should be this week, but the admin role is default, so uh, someone who's managing it is uh, defaultly uh, edit. Uh, so probably I want to just add a family member, right? Um, some someone and and when I when I do that, uh, GPT-4 is the same basically tries to describe what the family member uh, can do with the app. Um, I don't want to edit it here, but mostly our users through this tool around 250 apps was already generated. Um, so uh, I can tell that our users often edit these descriptions, you know, because it it it's degenerates something, but it's often not exactly what they want. So, uh, but for this demonstration, let's stay with that. Uh, is there someone who think we need another role in the in the project uh, outside administrator and family member? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I can uh, write here anything. Um, it doesn't look like that. It's going to be added in next update. I'm not sure if in this week or the next one. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel. We're posting uh, weekly updates uh, how to generate apps with Contember Studio. So uh, feel free to watch us. And uh, it's definitely going to be uh, seen here. 
Uh, there's a quick check if the intent uh, doesn't contain something that we might have need another row for. It doesn't, so let's continue to the user flows. And uh, if you're in uh, into uh, you know web web development, you probably know user flows. Uh, we need to describe it uh, what the users need to do. So family member family member will add a gift uh, he wants to receive. It works the same. Very boring uh, at the moment because it works the, the same as the as the roles. Um, and yeah. By the way, this is the this is the 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 speed of GPT four. This is how GPT four returns returns data. Uh, if we would use three point five, we wouldn't see the typing. You know, three point five turbo. It would just be there, but the data would be very much. Uh, let's say not usable uh, at the be before this tool looked like this uh, we had a different version that from the intent we generated all the steps for you and you just could edit what you wanted uh, um, it didn't work at all uh, because it just um, it, it imagined too many weird stuff that you didn't want to or didn't add stuff that you want wanted to so uh, we we uh, decided to uh, to not to do that. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, press this button here. Hopefully, it will tell me that uh, there's not some missing stuff. It might. Uh, I, I, actually, I'm I'm just gonna add a second one. Family member wants to assign to some gift. Gift. Yep, I'm gonna add this one, so it's gonna be uh, a bit complete. Um, still, still doing the same stuff, uh, and um, yep. And now I'm just gonna press generate. Uh, now the uh, this is a very boring. Uh, what should I press? What should I press? Well, how do you feel? Zero, zero, ten. Seven. I, I like seven. Thank you. Um, seven. Uh, no, I'm done with the. Uh, it's me, guys. Um, they're gonna they're gonna hate me tomorrow. Um, okay. So this is this is the most uh, critical step. It honestly might fail. We we succeed like in in uh, five from six. Um, you know iterations. Uh, so basically, it 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 builds a huge prompt for the GPT-4 uh, and transforms the app into uh, and it it, it already worked uh, into a schema. Uh, we we iterated uh, through several different uh, versions. The first one obviously was to uh, you know generate code uh, in our contemporary platform right from uh, GPT. So there are two issues with that. Uh, the the primary one is that GPT, even GPT-4, can sometimes hallucinate. For example, a React component that doesn't exist. You know, uh, you want to it want you have some box and it just say, hey, I think in React boxes are familiar. So it it names it somehow, put it there, and you just it it won't work. Uh, so that that's one issue. The second one, uh, and uh, I'm therefore I'm ha kind of happy that we ended up in this place, is that uh, there's gonna be a huge, huge, huge uh, issues with who owns the code, who the, what GPT wrote. Uh, it's starting in America, uh, and there's definitely not clear uh, if me, who kind of made the inputs of the app. Uh, can uh, or have uh, copyright uh, for the code that that was generated. Uh, so if I would then then give you the application to download and edit yourself, which I'm gonna do just in a minute, uh, I might have a legal issue with that. So what we're doing is that from the description you wrote, we are building a YAML file uh, that's basically annotation of of your web application that you described. 
there's a lot and lot of you know uh, uh, stuff that we named ourselves and basically this, this the, the decided how the YAML should look should look like and from this YAML then we generate code through basic code generation if you if you know how crude generators work uh, it's basically the same uh, when we get into the app you will see that it's very crude like at the moment give us three weeks it's gonna look a very different uh, anyway, uh, what it generated. So we see we've got the administration. I said that we've got the family member. Uh, and the first one is that we can invite family members. Contember has uh, uh, users built in. So we just have, a, have, have here a person ID, which is a connector to the tenant API. Uh, we've got gifts. So family member can read gifts. And here we see the issue. Uh, he can't create or edit gifts, uh, which we would like to do. Um, so we can change it right here. Um, and the gift has name, description, priority, uh, uh, relation to the to the member, uh, and if someone is signed to that, that's fine. And so I'm just gonna uh, say it's done, and let's deploy that. Uh, it's gonna open uh, the uh, the dialog to deploy to our Contember cloud, and I could download the zip file. Uh, I'm just gonna press deploy at the moment, um, and it, in about ten seconds it's gonna deploy. It. I'm not worried about this part because it always works. It's just code, no GPTs involved uh, anymore. Um, the worst part is the abstracture. Um, yeah, and this is here. Uh, I have to remind myself to invalidate the tokens uh, before the video goes live, uh, so uh, n no people can play with that. And uh, yeah, uh, one thing that I didn't figure out the, uh, b while while um, making this presentation uh, um, is that I forgot that it's gonna send me an invite. So I've got here in my email. Uh, invite to the app. Uh, I'm just gonna accept it on my phone, uh, set a password, uh, and I'm gonna log in uh, through yeah, this thing. Okay, so um, yep, it, it says, and I uh, uh, oh, sorry, it didn't set the password because it doesn't match as I'm writing it uh, after two beers um and a live in front of the audience so and i'm kind of thrilled it worked you know um okay good uh, so it worked now i'm gonna put it in uh no i don't want to uh do anything okay so and this is it o we are inside the application we've got the family member uh we could you know um add someone new uh looks like the internet's not working real great at the moment uh or maybe there's a bug you know you never know um uh, um i think i think this is this is a more more likely uh this is more likely uh some issue with internet anyway uh i could create gifts and family members it should work i'm not sure why at the, it doesn't at the moment uh, what I uh, what I can show you as well is that I can download the zip file which contains the Contember project. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lukash, who uh, uh, borrowed me this computer because mine didn't work. So thank you, and I'm sorry for messing your um, your computer with uh, some weird sh weird stuff. Um, and I just need a VS Code or something. Is is it here? Is is there a VS VS Code? <laughs> <laughs> you're awesome you're awesome yep it's here uh i see it's running in uh, in uh, full screen mode yeah okay S can you open it uh, uh I, it's download uh but i'm not sure how this is ah this one yep thank you so how basically how Contember works really quickly is that you got the, the, the data model, 
um, here are here are uh, the uh, the entities for the database and in the background there's a postgres sql uh, there's uh, a, a, a access control for the family member uh, it tells uh, when it can see stuff etc and there's an uh, administrator uh, basically at or inter something we call interface which is, which which is a react sdk to you know uh you to to see the interface that we that we built and this this is a some basic form and we've got something we call data binding so you don't have to worry about how the data from api are uh you know uh, pulled into the app and then saved so basically this is the code that you need to write if you want to um uh edit uh, some gift so that's the demo it it worked i'm i'm happy uh, and let's get back right into the presentation uh, and just uh, uh, no this is not my presentation uh, this this one is mine so I'm just gonna skip these that I had prepared if it wouldn't work uh, and there's there are a few tips how it works you know I mentioned a few uh, already but uh, anyway from from the description that the user write we use gpt4 to to generate the yaml Th that's that's the most Im most ai part uh we're obviously looking to another models still gpt4 wins a lot uh and from the yaml uh, we generate the declarative code in contember um our advantage at the moment, I think that uh, we are, we already had a platform that was declarative, so the code that you download is, you know, uh, understandable very quickly. Uh, so that's what we are using. Uh, and we are obviously uh, trying to see if we can make uh, changes in the app through the GPT-4 or, or basically any, any AI model. Uh, it's much more problematic because you can't break the app you know if someone is using it and uh it says i want to change this so you can not break anything that's already working so that that's that's uh, that's fun uh, but if you would try to build something like that so the first thing you need to do is to build some interface that you will give users and get users because they will write completely different things there that uh, than you think that they will you know uh, I know how to use Studio, so uh, uh, the the roles, the user flows, it was very you know simple, clear, and I kind of knew how to format the stuff that that I inputted there. Uh, if you would look through the uh, hundreds of applications that that went through the Studio already, it's it's very messy. So that's the first part. Second part is you probably want some uh, some um in between language as we use yaml i, I already talked uh, with a few startups worldwide there uh, pretty much everyone uh, works in, in with a similar model if if they're using if they're doing something like this uh, obviously if they're doing a code assistant then they're training models and it's i think much harder to do we're still using apis basically uh, but uh, if you want to get into some let's say yaml or json uh the the great stuff is to uh use prompting for self improvement so what do i mean uh so you you've got some uh, input from the user uh it generates something that you almost like but there are too few bugs there in what it generated so you you take that to tell the GPT that okay here's the input here's what you returned and here's what I don't like please suggest what I should uh, change in the prompt that uh, it won't happen again uh, next time and you run it several times and actually it makes a uh, much difference so I recommend that second one and it's especially true for GPT-4 uh, my uh, predecessor in the talk uh, mentioned that if you're using the chat uh, APIs, there are three roles in the, there. Uh, one is system, one is user, and one is assistant. User and assistant are not super interesting. The system is interesting. And uh, in GPT-4, it actually m have a, like a 
very huge impact on what it generates. So if I if I in the system if I say just generate this YAML and nothing else, it it works, you know. So uh, that that's one part. And also, uh, don't be afraid to give as much examples in the in the uh, YAML as possible, and preferably uh, preferably for the use case that you're doing. So uh, as as uh, at the beginning, as I was mentioning, that we're we're trying to decide what type of app uh, actually uh, you're trying to build. Uh, so we are using it here and giving different examples of different app to the model to generate. Uh, GPT-4 and everything it's trained since till I think 2021. Uh, but uh, if you tell it what is Spotify or or build data model for Spotify, you can try it yourself in ChatGPT Pro or somewhere. It kind of knows that uh, there are artists, there are albums, there are relation in uh, etc. So you can use this uh, with the prompting, and if you give your your examples and uh, preferably a lot of them, uh, it it also gives uh, you much better much, much much better input. And one last funny thing here, uh, you know, we probably all heard the joke that be kind to AI because it won't kill you that fast when it takes over. Uh, so that that's the joke. The the funny, f um, more funny part for me uh, in it is that researchers that are playing a lot with these models are saying that if you actually use Preeth and thank you, uh, you get uh, let's say you you get better results in a measurable percent. Uh, and they think that it's because uh, you kind of uh, have more affinity to people who are nice and therefore probably had a better conversation somewhere uh, in the data that uh, it learned from. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, we're, we're, building, we're building the, the backend. So if someone would uh, try to write it there that, hey, I want to sell cocaine uh, and uh, manage it here, uh, we would definitely block it on the cloud when we would figure it out. I'm not sure if it would go through uh, OpenAI. We we don't do our own like uh, management of this thing. I'm not sure if OpenAI would filter it on, on their side at the moment. Uh, I, I'm sure that would help. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that this slide. Uh, let's. Uh, I, I've got a few more. Yeah. This is my favorite one. Okay. Um, so uh, you saw what you saw. Uh, what I take from it is that uh, we're gonna uh, be seeing very quickly uh, different, uh, different, uh, let's say, um, interactions with people who need web apps uh, with the developers. Uh, currently, uh, and my background is 20 years agency work, so I kind of know what uh, how that works. Uh, is that they meet some account manager, uh, they write the uh, description of how that works, then it uh, goes to a developer, he don't understand anything because it's gibberish probably, uh, and through a few months of iterations we get uh, an, an app. So I think AI tools like the ones that I showed you and others that will be coming, I think, very quickly. I actually was uh, ex was expecting that it's going to be a lot more uh, of them out there uh, in May. Uh, it's not. Um, we're building it from January. So uh, uh, it's not. I'm not sure why. Maybe we're doing something that nobody wants or maybe uh, they d didn't figure it out yet. So what I think is that the account manager will go to the meeting uh, with the prototype ready from like basic the phone call uh, and uh, on the meeting it will just add you know annotations to the app uh, for the developers to build. If they're going to be using the same thing that they build the prototype in or rebuild it in something else, I don't know. I hope they're going to be, be using our open source contember, but that, that's what I want. Uh, so that's the one thing. Uh, and the other one uh, is, and I'm seeing it more and more with people who are contacting, uh, contacting us, 
that there's so many up, uh, you know, software as a service applications out there that, uh, that to choose the right one for your company is just getting you know overwhelming so if i can generate something that kind of fits my needs i'm uh, probably fine with that because otherwise my uh, uh i would have to choose between 20 apps that are maybe better in something uh, but they have some functions that i don't want they cost this etc etc so um i think uh, it's going to be much harder for big software as a service companies uh it's the whole AI is obviously great for freelance developers. A lot of our users are freelance developers. We just use Contember as a backend, as a service for their project, and they can, you know, uh, work with more customers. Uh, and what I think is, it's gonna bring the building of your own app down. Uh, so uh, a lot of niche niche use cases, very local, can will now be uh, be uh, built and used by, I don't know, 100 users, but it's going to generate income for one developer uh, and he's going to, he or she is going to be very happy. And what I would honestly uh, like to see uh, is that uh, in the, and in, in, in agency work, we say clients, you know, uh, but uh, translate it as you like. Uh, what I would like to see is someone uh, I call digital director in, uh, on the client side, who will just make the basic step, maybe even generate the first version, take it through the department and comes after the developers with something already like, uh, okay, we know we need this. We tried it, we put it, some data into it uh, and we know we have this, this type of data, we need to uh, handle it this way, uh, etc. So uh, I'm saying like middleman has a problem, maybe, uh, but that, that's why this, there's question mark. So I, I think I'm already long, right? Uh, so um, to, to finish up, um, working with the, the models uh, of the last five months almost, is kind of like, okay, this is something we dreamed, uh, dreamed about for the last 10 years. Uh, and it's it's here and what what a lot of people is uh, doing at the moment is that they're trying to use it in the same environment that was bef before the models came and uh, if you look at the studio it kind of trans it could trans maybe it doesn't now but it could transform how how the process uh, you know um, goes from the uh, okay, I need the web application to I, I, I got it and I use it. And there's going to be a lot and lot and lot of use cases like that, which are going to change the process. And if you want to play with uh, these models and or build something, please try to think what part of the process are kind of broken or maybe take a too long time or maybe there's just too many communication and how AI can help with that because uh, it can already. And uh, I think uh, Sam Altman from OpenAI, uh, or I'm not sure if it was him, but someone said that even if we would stop uh, building new models today, which is not gonna happen, uh, if we would do that, we've got at least 10 years to figure out how to use the current models, um, you know, uh, and how to enhance what we do, how to how to enhance apps that we build, and how, how to enhance our lives uh, and uh, our work. So that is for me. Um, hope you are gonna make some uh, uh, small amount of magic. Uh, feel free to uh, ask me anything and ask for the invites to the studio. We always uh, welcome uh, any feedback. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Hanzo, for an amazing <laughs> talk. Let's fire up the Slido. Please take a seat. If there's okay. going to be some grilling okay. questions. So Let's do that. You will survive. I will start with an uh, easier one. Uh, pineapple on pizza? Yes Sorry. or no? Uh, no. Good. Good answer. <laughs> okay. Um, let's dig in. 
Um, Honzo, tell us, what is your pricing model? Uh, we currently charge for the hosting. So if you if you build an app and host it with us, uh, you pay us money. If you don't and host it somewhere else, which you can do, you don't. Uh, we try to get as many people on board as possible. And that's, uh, that's uh, why we raised a pre-seed round about two weeks ago. So, so that, that's it. Thank you. Can I get the cool gray pipe drive house shoe size 43, please? Um, you might get even the limited edition of the black ones. We have open <laughs> positions. Pipe drive is hiring. So just check our website, send the CV, and you might get it. I don't have them, sorry. <laughs> How is different Compass to the GitHub Copilot and Power Apps Copilot? Uh, what's Compass? Some. I'm I'm not sure, but basically, basically, what what a lot of companies is trying to do, and uh, GitHub is one of them with Copilot and Copilot X, and I think worth uh, worth following and not much known in Czech Republic is Replit with their Ghostwriter, uh, which works pretty similar to uh, to uh, Copilot, and. Basically, they're trying to uh, build like a helper or junior developer that the senior developers will, you know, interact with. Some people say that uh, that's a different way around. Uh, the junior developers will use them to uh, to write better code. Uh, you can choose your for yourself there, and there's a lot of uh, you know racing in this space uh, and. Uh, I haven't used Copilot X yet, so I can't uh, I can't tell there. Ghostwriter is very impressive. So Replit Ghostwriter, if you don't know, check it out. Uh, PowerS Copilot I haven't used, so can't can't tell there. Uh, any any comments from your side if you use that? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I don't know if you are familiar with low code no code platforms. One yep. of them is Micros Power Platform. It's quite easy to make apps. It's yep. very fast, mm -hmm. but there are some also issues. It's like with coding. Mm -hmm. So and Microsoft have an initiative that uh, they will make Copilot. You will basically what you are doing there. Yep. You will describe your app, and they will generate your app. They will basically also deploy. So yep. it's quite easy. They have different pricing model, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. They are paying for the licenses per users or it's per Microsoft. app, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well it's very good. Thank and you, did you try it yourself? Okay, okay, cool. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's probably worth mentioning that next meetup, we are also open to take another speakers. <laughs> If you would like to join and share, thank you very much. Um, what is your short-term goal? And what do you think will be possible to build in five years? Also, what has been the most complex project built so far? And is it live? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's going to be a bit longer question. So short-term goal is to launch on Product Hunt uh, by the end of uh, June. Uh, and basically we're going to communicate to the whole freelancers out there to use contember as a backend as a service and kick kick start their application with the with the studio uh, the studio is basically onboarding for them um, uh, uh, a bit more long not that short term goal is to help uh, smes uh, uh, you know very small or small companies uh, to uh, quit Excel uh, and uh, similar stuff and have app that uh, fits their need, uh, have it quickly and have it cheaply. Uh, so that's that's still this year. And by the end of the year, hopefully raise a seed round and go global. So that's that. Uh, also, we hope to have by the end of the year uh, a, a helper that will uh, some some task that you will a gift to a generated applicant, it will change uh, by itself. Uh, we'll already started some work on that, but uh, 
uh, as I mentioned, it's going to be uh, more more hardcore, let's say. Uh, and yeah, sorry. The most uh, complex can, can project. We, uh, com most complex and if it's project. Life. Yeah. yeah uh, well, uh, maybe our advantage is that we generate project in the Contember platform. Uh, which we've been building for the last four years. So no, it's not something that we've built just for AI. Uh, I th I'm not sure. Uh, I think most complex pro projects are actually by uh, people who are not us, but uh, developers who are using it as an open source platform. Um, and uh, one is a quite complicated ERP system for uh, an... Um, uh, let's say development uh, company. They're, they're renting a huge uh, storage, uh, uh, you know, on the out outskirts of cities, and they have quite weird needs uh, in the in the in this space. So they needed something custom, and they they're building it on top of Contember. So that's one. The other one, maybe you know, magazine Respect CZ, uh, which uh, is running on top of Contember. It it uses basically Contember as headless CMS. Uh, our friends at Network Agency built that. Honzik there uh, uh, was one of the lead uh, frontend devs. So that's I think two stuff that I can mention there. Good stuff. Is it possible to create a checkout web shop? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, we can help you as a as a as a system where you have your uh, orders, where you have your product, but uh, we don't uh, at all generate the front end for the users at the moment. We're looking into that. Uh, we're currently taking advantage of the data binding that I mentioned that you don't have to write queries for yourself, and it's written in the React, uh, and it needs to run in a browser. So we have a kind of problem with the server side, and I I don't want to give uh, to front end or to ordinary users something that's not server side. So that's why we're not uh, exploring this at the moment. Uh, hopefully, uh, somewhere later uh, on the road. Do I understand correctly that the functionality is limited, defined by your YAML DSL? What's all the possible features besides CRUD? Uh, Yes, you do, uh, but uh, I'm not sure if limited. You know, you can ba if you have your own, um, you know, format how to how to uh, describe um, describe uh, application. You can pretty much uh, put there anything, and it's just in some structured form. So that that's the demo. Uh, we're currently um, a lot of because we uh, we are not that big a team where we're 10 people and two of, two of those uh, joined just in May so uh, so we didn't get there uh, uh, yet uh, but uh, we think that the the end result shouldn't be much uh, different than from what a developer would build uh, on the on the first first try and uh, but it's gonna take us at least a month or month and a half to get into something like not that crudely like uh i'm i'm very much looking forward to that honestly what parts of the building process are hard coded what are lm driven um is uh, karel can you can you elaborate uh, uh, where your question is a uh, headache. I'm, I'm not sure how to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There were these parts. Yeah. So there were these parts where we were defining like the rows mm -hmm. and flows. Yeah. So this is the part that is hard coded, right? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, so this is pretty much what was my okay. question. <laughs> so that's your answer. Yeah. We were uh, in the studio. We're trying to fit the user into some sort of structure. And we hope to make it more like you're talking in with some, uh, you know, uh, business analyst, but but uh, so someone who who kind of helps you build what you want and kind of leave the structure that's uh, hard coded at the moment. But it's going to be a, a longer route. So currently, it works in a way that you have to fill the intent, the rows, and the, the flows. That's the hard coded part. Uh, other parts are not hard hard coded. 
All right, be conscious of time. Okay. We will finish here, but I encourage you to find Honza after the last uh, last talk from Peter to ask him quite more. Thank you very much, Honzo. Thank you. We are going to continue with the last talk, so please don't, don't leave yet. And take back your seats. We're going to have Petr Hozak. Guys in the back, I will ask you either come and take your seats or please um, be respectful to our last speaker. The pipe drivers in the back, just shut up. <laughs> okay, so we have Peter. Even though Peter is a front-end developer, um, his passion is Python, and through the Python, he actually discovered AISafety.info, and he will talk about AI safety, racing toward progress, or the edge of a cliff. So, stage is yours. Thank you. So, yeah, first, I want to mention that uh, AI safety is like kind of two things. One thing is just software development, safety and security. If you are creating an application, if it's just a toy, then yeah, like go ahead. If you are going to create a product and people like uh, are going to pay for it, and then you are legally res responsible for everything that it does. Like it doesn't matter like that AI helped you. Like if it if your application is going to like recommend someone to uh, cause harm or anything, you are responsible for it. So. Like that doesn't change about previous software development. Like Facebook is making a social network and they are responsible for what happens on in the society about social networks. And uh, with the new AI, new AI, we can make a lot of toys currently. Uh, it's not sure how how many like production ready apps will be there because like for example, Bing uh, with AI is more expensive to run than uh, they get from advertisement. Uh, so it's not not really a business product yet. Uh, but what I want to talk today is a uh, different kind of danger. Like we are creating new and smart, like a uh, new kind of intelligence. And uh, people are thinking about like what happens if you create new and smarter kind of intelligence in the, not in next year, but maybe in 10 years, 50 years, we don't know. But uh, one idea is that uh, if you create more intelligent things, there is no correlation, there is no physical law that says that it will have some goals that are good for humanity. Like you can imagine that something that is not intelligent, like bacteria, like they can do some stuff. And uh, if the you have more intelligent beings, like human beings, they can do good in the world, like they can help other people and they can kill other people like on purpose and have like there in and there are some people in the society uh, who who have like different brain structure like if they are sociopaths then uh, some of them co could be intelligent some of them could be less intelligent but it doesn't matter like uh, they can uh, do good in the world they can do evil in the world but they just don't have like their internal moral compass and they get uh, the moral compass from somewhere else but there is no correlation between higher intelligence and uh, like moral values of to other people. So it's up to us to create systems that are both more intelligent and better for the humanity. So it doesn't happen automatically. It's it needs to be engineered inside those systems. So, and this principle 
is called the orthogonality thesis. And uh, the that's the idea that when you create more intelligent systems, it doesn't automatically become more good in the world, but you they're like two separate and um, like orthogonal in mathematics. Uh, uh, so that's like one principle why AI in the future might be dangerous. That it doesn't happen automatically that the smarter the system is, the better it will be in the world. So that's first point. The second point. Too high contrast, but no. Uh, whatever you want in the world, whatever goal you have for yourself, or any intelligence for itself, there is always something in the world that uh, that can bring you closer to the goal in the long term. And for example, like a lot of people want money, but they don't want to have just money for money itself. Whatever your goal is, like you want to have like your kids to go to the college, uh, you want to go to the vacation, whatever you want, or uh, you want just food and don't have employment yet, so uh, it's going to be in instrumentally useful to you to have something that is uh, on the path to your goals. And there are some things like collecting more resources or having like uh, being m smarter about uh, how you go in the world. So if you can be smarter than you are currently, you want to be smarter to figure out how to achieve your goals better. So there are some things that the more smart you are, the more of them you want, like resources in the world. And uh, it can create competition between resources because some of the resources on Earth, like cobalt, they are like limited. And whether you create like smartphones or electric cars, the price of the cobalt is going up. And uh, some things in the world, the, they will like, they will have these dynamics. So some things that the AI will want, they can compete with what uh, humans want. Like for example, the, the uh, in the uh, literature from like 20 years ago about AI safety, like the common example was that uh, even if the AI would want to have like maximized the number of paper clips, then it's still useful for that goal to like trade on the market and earn some money to buy some factories to create paper clips and then uh, uh, maybe convert all atoms on earth to paper clips because that will increase the number of paper clips. So it doesn't matter what the original goal is. There are always some instrumental goals that are convergent between almost all possible goals that the higher intelligence can have. So that's the I that's the other basic idea here. And the third and the last idea in this short introduction to AI safety, it's about speed. So different people have different uh, estimations about the future and how AI is going to improve. So uh, Either the takeoff, like uh, if uh, we start like uh, working with GPT, and in the next year, is it going to be exponentially better or just a little bit better? And in the on the other axis, like uh, over the long term, will we hit some limit, and it will slow down naturally, or if it's going to be exponentially faster and faster and better and more intelligent and more and more and more. And different people disagree on both of these, so it's very controversial. And for example, like OpenAI, they think that uh, we are going to hi hit uh, some limit, uh, yep, yep. we are going to hi li hit some natural limits in the long term. And that means that it's good to speed things up today so that we can experiment with the systems that we have today and then in the long term like we uh, all like the ai safety research will catch up because they will the safety research will have tools from today that they can use uh, to improve the ai of tomorrow so it's less dangerous tomorrow and they think it's good to like uh, it's all called hard takeoff like uh, release things in the world like ChatGPT and GPT-4, 
like very fast today because they think that uh, it will eventually slow down and it's better to have the tools today to play with than uh, like a sudden like sudden change in the in the future like because in the future uh, it's not only the quality of the software that is going to improve in AI but it's also the quality of the hardware like GPUs and stuff like that and they think that if we wait today it will be uh, much more unpredictable tomorrow there are most other people think that uh, we should slow down just saying <laughs> and so yeah this is the speed and all three thing things combined so you have like uh, the intelligence is not highly correlated with moral values by default only by design that the uh, some of the like some of the goals are going to be instrumental no matter what is like the original goal of the AI, but it will always want to have more resources, more compute, more something, and it can compete with uh, other economic actors. Uh, and the third thing is like how fast we are going to like release new large language models, and how fast are we going to improve the like safety engineering of those AIs. So like that's why people are worried that uh, we are going too fast and we are going with too much power and uh, so on. The language that was used like 20 years ago in from 2001 uh, was from a time when reinforcement learning uh, seemed like the most promising uh, technology. And today we don't have uh, reinforcement learning as the best AI it's still used and it's good for some tasks but the general most general today are language models and large language models and uh, so the terminology the that happened in the safety world is slightly different than the terminology used by the machine learning uh, scholarship and uh, like the biggest difference is about uh, agents so you have some goals and you perform actions in the world and that kind of system is called an agent like it comes from economic theory and uh, g game theory but uh, you are an agent if you have some internal goal and you perceive the like what happens observe the world and make some actions and uh, when agents are smarter and smarter and smarter they become more and more potentially dangerous like uh, language models are not agents and uh, the way like the people actually created language models because they were uh, worried about AI safety and uh, they created some systems that should be better however like the first thing then uh, like you can do when you get uh, access to GPT-4 you can create an like little agent that uh, executes the commands from the language model so it it turns out that like you can really easily convert uh, output of the large language model into commands and then perform actions in the world and so on so it's we are not completely safe so it's not completely safe like system automatically but there is hope that the if we scale up current AIs we can make them safe and like there are some like security engineering that happens like in computer science and something like that could happen in AI that would make the, the system safer and one of the approaches to uh, bridge the language between the AI safety and the current uh, AI capabilities research uh, is uh, like different terminology and uh, if we call them simulators so a large language model if you imagine that it's trying to simulate a conversation between two people and to correctly predict what happens in the conversation it needs to simulate some like kind of human beings inside but very simplified and that means like uh, if there are two people who are speaking to each other that it makes sense that one of the person is simulated to have a theory of mind like what the other one thinks so there's like 
lots of intuitions that come out of like if you if we start to think about large language models as simulating the world in order to predict what happens in the text next and uh, there are like lots of like a couple of weeks and months of other steps to like understand fully like what it means and whatever but like the idea is that uh, just because we see some happy face on the interface it doesn't mean that like behind there is some alien mind that is doing something that we don't understand like we don't know how it's predicting the text we are trying to learn and it's not an unsolvable problem so there are a lot of research ideas how to improve the situation uh, so you probably heard about fine tuning and if not like if you imagine prompt engineering then you know like 90 percent about what is fine tuning so like you you basically change the prompt and build it into your system so it's like baked in and the user cannot escape we we all know that how that works in practice but uh, uh, you can change the output of the model by fine tuning there is something called uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback that was done uh, between GPT-3 and chat GPT and there was uh, a big improvement in about uh, the quality of the conversation with chat GPT that's because of something that is called uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback uh, open AI is act they have a description of it but they call it something differently because there were lots of criticism that uh, reinforcement learning like has all the uh, nasty things that will happen to it if we scale it up so it's like it works fine for now but it won't work for GPT-5 for example right? and some of the criticism is called the Val Valuigi effect so if anyone uh, was playing uh, Mario so there is like the main character is called Luigi and uh, there is like the, the super villain who is exactly opposite kind of like the main character so that means like once you specify the good assistant it only takes like a few bits of, of information to switch sweep uh, like uh, f uh, flip it to the opposite like uh, once the model figures out how uh, someone good should behave it's very easy to predict how someone evil should behave because like doing the opposite of and uh, so like uh, that means like it's it's very fragile to fine-tune to assistant personality because the uh, the model doesn't know that it's whether it's uh, simulating an assistant or if it's simulating someone who pretends to be assistant but is actually wants to be like evil because there are lots of I don't know, science fiction movies and uh, where like uh, plot twists happen and that's actually one thing why saying please and thank you improves the performance of the current large language models because uh, on the internet conversations that are polite tend to be more helpful than conversations that are toxic like are you simulating stack overflow or are you simulating fortune and the, the model does not know in which situation it is so like you are trying to tell it like yeah please be nice to me because like we are on yeah some nice site and not not on the dark side of the internet yeah. uh, the okay. other one so there are other research ideas for improving our like mathematical understanding of the world so like what are agents so like uh, we can like we have some intuitive understanding like like in economy the agents are like people groups of people nation states but w in computing what are agents like we need better definitions like to actually uh, prove when an agent is good when an agent is uh, uncontrollable and stuff like that and with that like uh, there are like related mathematical conceptions like natural abstraction what kind of agents will think that this is a chair as opposed to a collection of atoms like so that's like when what kind of abstractions can we expect of alien minds in silicon to to create like currently with language models most of the uh, like the abstractions don't have to be natural they just have to simulate what humans would think 
but uh, in the long term, if the AI is better and better and better, then uh, the AI is going to have some new abstractions that we cannot think of, like some combination of atoms that people don't consider currently because of our limited intelligence yeah. and uh, yeah, other mathematical concepts. Yeah. Uh, the next one <coughs> is mechanistic interpretability. What that means is that we take lang uh, language model or other neural network and we look inside and we try to interpret like this neuron, what is it doing? Like, is it doing some uh, in image recognition? Maybe it's uh, like detecting edges. May, uh, maybe it's detecting whether it's a cat on or dog. Maybe it's detecting cars. In language models, it's much harder to say. But uh, because uh, like the neurons in the transformer architecture, they are not uh, something th that is called like a they don't have a privileged basis, so it's very hard to interpret uh, what are the features that the model is learning. Uh, how are those represented as numbers in like the in the multidimensional matrices? But uh, so we it's very hard to interpret. But the pro some progress is done. There is some open source library called Transformer Lens. Then there is some work uh, done by OpenAI how to use language models to explain smaller language models and they like uh, maybe like I think 1% of the neurons in uh, GPT-2 can be interpreted in like English sentences by GPT-4. So it looks promising but we are not there yet. And that leaves us like if we don't have technical solution yet, should we have some regulation? Should we slow down development of new models? So like uh, people can play with the current models, they seem fine, like they say, like because either uh, you don't have enough money to run them s like so long to be dangerous or you have uh, humans uh, like in the loop. So it gives you some answer, then you improve the answer, you create your application, you try to run your application before you uh, send it to users. So you like test it and stuff like that. But should there be some regulation like in construction industry? Like, do you want to walk a bridge that was not checked by anyone? Like, that the company is claiming this is a good bridge. People don't usually do that. And like in healthcare, like, do you want to buy medication that was not clinically tested? Like, there are lots of problems with regulation, but there are also lots of benefits from regulation. Like, like children in the European schools don't have to be afraid of mass shootings. Like, some regulations are good, and maybe like. Uh, Regulation of AI might be good, but there needs to be discussion like what should be permitted because it's safe and what should be uh, slowed down because it's dangerous and there needs to be like explicit reason why something is uh, like like explanation like it shouldn't be like a regulation or like uh, uh, yeah. uh, GDPR, it had good explanation like we want to protect privacy, but uh, the end result of GDPR is like helpful to the big Facebooks and Microsofts, and it's harmful to small websites. So it's, it maybe it was not the best regulation like the previous examples. So let's not go there. <laughs> and uh, my last point is, uh, before governments can make any regulation, they take time. It might take some years, and so discussion is needed. And uh, for the discussion to happen before more dangerous things are released to the world, then uh, there, like the, there is a call to make a pause, like six months, let's not release any new uh, large language model that is more capable than GPT-4. So the people, when people don't know what to do, they organize themselves, there are going to be protests in front of OpenAI, and uh, I'm not saying it's a good answer, I don't know, but people are going to like uh, if they want to prevent uh, if they if people think that AI is going to be existentially dangerous like it's if it's going to kill a lot of people then they are going to make some protests and stuff like that 
So like we either need to find some solutions and explain it to people in like in a language that people understand that this is safe, or we actually have to slow down if we think it's dangerous. So like more research needed. So that's that's information I have today. <laughs> and if anyone is interested, like why oh no, I actually talked about that, but we have questions already. Okay. And we can do the Q&A now. Let's fire up our Slido. But before we start, pineapple on the pizza. Yes or no? Not for myself. I'm happy for other people. Good, yeah. good. <laughs> OK. Question from Daniel. How likely AI will ultimately decide how likely AI will ultimately decide who will live and who will die. Warfare, edge distribution, medicine. Should we strive to prevent it? Uh, today, it's still up to us, like how much we let AI to decide. If we think that our politicians are really bad people and the AI is better, then we will let the AI decide and then it will decide everything. So like we either need to figure out how to do it between humans or it will decide itself. Like yeah. So that's like my opinion, not not any research agenda. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. How can it be prevented that the majority of AI resources are owned by only a few big companies? in order to avoid a monopoly situation where power, where power is distributed in an unhealthy way. Yeah. So we live in some economic reality, which is currently capitalism. So that's going to happen by default. If you want to change it, we can, change, we can ask for more regulation or we can try to change our political system or we can make any like, uh, what we are empowered as citizens in democracies to to try to affect policy that's like uh, it's not going to happen by default like if we are going to complain on facebook that doesn't help yeah. go vote right <laughs> yeah Hop hopefully someone will have that kind of agenda in the <laughs> all companies claim they work on ai safety how can i evaluate with which claims are honest yeah so the situation today is similar like like the medication in 100 years ago like there are lots of people claiming that uh, a snake oil is good for you or heroin is good for you and uh, the regulations came in to control like uh, what kind of edit evidence is admissible to present to people and for medication you need clinical trials for ai what we can do is like we have some intuition like what is just marketing claim and when the company writes a paper that explains the problem and explains what steps they use to solve a problem. So maybe like not just reading the Twitter, maybe also clicking the link and checking the paper if it could help. <laughs> yeah, it's time consuming. Yeah. Is there some data-backed research proving the orthogenality thesis on humans? Uh, 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 nothing comes to mind right now, but yeah, th it was. I was only reading articles from twenty years ago, so like it was backed up by uh, uh, the the reasons were mostly philosophical like it doesn't matter what like evolution found that humans are good at if we are not using the same algorithm to find the programs but we are using different algorithms to find ais so we are not using biological evolution to create the ais we are using gradient descent so the 
Like, would, we, would you be happy if there was like 90% correlation that the more intelligent AIs are better, but we create one million of them? And only like only three of them will destroy the world. Is it still is it okay? Like, like that's like uh, uh, it's a difference between uh, disjunctive reasoning when it doesn't matter how many things you have. Like uh, it will be okay if uh, half of them are bad. That's still fine. Uh, and uh, the conjunctive reasoning that all of it needs to be bad for something bad to happen. It's like, uh, if we live in a world that uh, bad things create more harm, like uh, attacking someone and destroying is easier than defending and protecting yourself, which we seem to live in because like of warfare, yeah, then uh, it seems like to be more cautious we need to prevent all of the AIs that are smarter than humans from doing evil things. Like so, like they, it doesn't matter that 99% will be fine and 1% will will be uh, will want to collect resources from our atoms. Then uh, it's still a bad situation. So it's like kind of like we have to. It's like a uh, computer security. It doesn't matter that. 99% of your operating system is patched and secure. It's only that one vulnerability that is going to allow the hackers to destroy your operating system of your users. Last question for you. Won the EU regulation make everything worse? <laughs> yeah, like it can happen if we, like if people don't join the discussion, like uh, if people know what kind of regulation is good, what kind of is bad, then they should join the discussion. If they like, uh, if the only voice is from the companies creating the AIs, then uh, the regulation will be what OpenAI and Microsoft and Google want. If it's if the discussion is only going to be to happen from like uh, people who want to like shut off all computers and all internet, then that's what the politicians is will be hearing from people opposing AI. So they are like crazy people who want to shut down the internet. That's not possible. So <laughs> they need to hear some reasonable voices. And yeah, it's it's going to be a process. Yeah. So hopefully this time they won't screw it. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Okay, guys, this was uh, last talk. Thanks again, Lukas, Honza, Peter. Last round of applause to all of them. For amazing talks regarding the AI. That's the end of the talking part. You can still go grab some treats and uh, the, the talks will be shared on our YouTube channel. So if there was something interesting you would like to come back to, you have a chance. Also, for you who are interested, there will be a guided office tour, so you can check the other parts of this place. So that's it. Thank you all for coming.